Now tonight, first of all, I want to look at the construction of the tabernacle itself, and I have here some charts that will be of help to us. Now, first of all, let's get before us the tabernacle and the floor plan of it again. It was a hundred cubits by fifty cubits, and of course that would be a hundred and fifty feet by seventy-five. And that was for the outer court. We talked about this fence last time around the outer court. Inside was the brazen altar and the lava. Both of them were made of brass. And as we saw Sunday night, they dealt with the sin question. The sin question was settled out here. Here is where it was settled for the sinner. A sinner that needs forgiveness comes here. Here is where the saint that needs cleansing because of sin. And the sin question must be settled before any approach is made to God in either the holy place or the holy of holies. Now, the tabernacle proper was 30 cubits by 10 cubits, and it was 10 cubits high, as we shall see. And inside the first compartment, it was divided by a veil here, and the Holy of Holies was ten cubits by ten, a perfect cube, by the way. And this was ten by twenty, and in here was the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of prayer. These have to do with worship, and worship has to do with this. You and I never worship God. Or well, we can go to church. Somebody says, I've been to church, I've been to worship service. But you may not have worshipped, because worship has to do with the Holy Spirit, the light of the world, taking the things of Christ and showing them unto us, feeding us on the bread of life, and praying in a way that we pray, and not only prayers heard but answered. And until that takes place, we've never worshipped God. There's a lot of going to church today that's about as ineffective as it possibly can be. It just doesn't get anywhere at all. A lot of people today, it's a form, a ceremony with them. I heard the story about the little girl the other day that her grandmother took her to the circus for the first time she'd ever been to a circus. And believe me, when she got home, she was excited. And she was telling her mother all about it, and finally she ended up, and she says, Mom, if you'd ever go to the circus, you'd never want to go to church again. And I'm of the opinion the little girl expressed what's in the heart of a great many people today, because they go to church, but they do not worship. And we'd never worship God until these three articles of furniture come into activity in our lives. They have to. Then the Holy of Holies, in there were two articles of furniture, the ark and the top of it, and that's all it was. But it was a mercy seat, highly ornamented. Now, there's seven articles of furniture. Now, we are going to see this is the tabernacle proper, and we want us to look at it. And this, the man who made this chart is sitting out there tonight. He's in our class down in Orange County, and we appreciate what he's done for us here. This is, I hope you can read that, and I'm sure you can. Yes, I can even improve it. If you'll notice, thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of chitim wood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons shall there be in one board, set in order one against another. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. Thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side, southward. Thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be twenty boards." And there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. Now, this is the construction of it, and here you have the boards and the sockets. Put here twenty boards, 
and under each one of them, they're cubit and a half wide, why you have underneath two of these sockets that are used. They put them down in them. They were made of silver, by the way. We'll see that. And the same would be on the other side. And then there's six back here. These are the boards. And you notice what it says. The boards for the tabernacle of Chittim wood standing up. I want to come back to that, but let me give this first. This here is another picture that will help you to understand. Now, actually, unfortunately, the one who gave this chart did not give us the accurate detail because we actually have five of these bars on each side. The only one went all the way through and two above it and two below. That would be true on the other side and in the back also. These are the bars we're talking about. And the pillars, we're going to talk about them tonight. There were five of them here and four here. This gives you something of the understanding of the tabernacle. Now again, maybe this will be helpful to you. This is the back end of the tabernacle, and it shows how it was put together. Here are your sockets. They were of silver, however, not gold. And here were the bars and these rings that were put in there through which the bars were pushed. And then you have here these corner boards that the two extra boards were put in there. Now, I want us to look at those for just a moment here tonight because there is a tremendous message that we have in the boards. Now, you're going to hear me say this during this study several times and you'll probably smile after I've said it two or three times, I'll say we have now come to that which is the probably the best picture of Christ that there is in the Bible. And when I say that, it will be because there will be a certain facet of the person of Christ that's emphasized by that particular part of the tabernacle, and in that it is the best representation that we have of it. Now, I believe we've come to one of those tonight in the boards that we have here. The boards here were made of acacia wood, we're told. There were 20 of them on a side, cubit and a half wide, and they were 10 cubits high. These boards were made of a wood that I'm told is similar to our red wood. That is, it's a more or less of an indestructible wood. And these boards were covered over with gold. That's the reason, one of the reasons, the tabernacle was such a valuable thing. It was a little gem, to tell the truth, and it's been variously estimated that anywhere from two to five million dollars went into the construction of the tabernacle, that is, in the current exchange today. And we find that these sockets down here, and actually the sockets are twice as many as the boards because there are two sockets that go for each board, you see, and they are silver sockets. Except the entranceway and the socket here for these five pillars, they are of brass. Now, in this, we have probably the finest picture that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. I did not bring down something I wanted tonight, but that's all right. I really don't need it. But may I say that what I'd like for you to see, that you can say that these boards are gold boards, and you'd be accurate, and you could say they're wooden boards, and you'd be accurate. They're both. They're wooden boards, and they're gold. And it can be said of the Lord Jesus Christ that he is God. The goal represents his deity. It can be said of him that he is man. The wood represents his humanity. And the very interesting thing is that the gold is over the wood. And that there's no combining of the two. No blending of the two. There are two definite separate materials. One is wood and one is gold, and yet you have one board. There are not two boards. It's one board, and it's made of wood. It's covered over with gold. Here you have, I believe, one of the finest representation 
of what is known as the hypostatical union. And when we say hypostatical union, we mean the two natures that are in Christ. He was God and he was man. It's interesting when he was born, and this is the reason that the virgin birth is so essential. No man could ever have been the father because what you would have would be two persons. And you don't have two persons in Christ. You have two natures. You have the divine nature and you have the human nature. And nature is something that you get from your mother. That holy thing that's conceived in these of the Holy Ghost. But the person you get from the Father. You remember what God said concerning Abraham? When Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Levi was in his loins, not Sarah's, but his. That's interesting, by the way. No man could have been the father of Jesus. You'd have had a double person. And isn't it marvelous how the Word of God keeps it accurate? You have that, the wonderful fact that he's God. And the virgin birth ensures that. And that's the reason that the virgin birth is important. When anybody tells me today that you can be a Christian and deny the virgin birth, I say this because I must confess for a while I took the position. I believed in the virgin birth, but I said anybody else, as I see it, could deny it if they wanted to because that's not what saved you. But I say this, if you deny the virgin birth, you do not have a reliable savior. You do not have one who's able to save you. You have just a man. You see, he is the ladder let down from heaven. Jacob saw a ladder let down from heaven. It touched the ground. And the Lord Jesus said to Nathaniel, I'm that ladder. You're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He was let down from heaven. And he is able to save. He's God. He's let down from heaven, but he touches the earth. He is made of our humanity. He has our humanity. He touches earth, but he touches heaven. Some of these folk today, and the liberal, to my judgment, is attempting to do the old faker trick that is attributed to the Indian faker. You know, the fellow that comes out and takes the rope pitches it up in the air, and it stays up in the air, and then he has his assistant, he climbs up that, and then gets to the top, and then just climbs out and disappears up above. The only thing is, nobody's ever seen that trick. I was in a theater once where they had a magician, and he did that, and a friend of mine, we were in college together, he was working backstage. And he said to me, he said, you didn't see that black thread tied to that rope that pulled it up. That's the way it went up, you see. Nobody's ever really seen the trick. It's never been done genuinely, except in liberal churches. It's done there. They put up the old rope yes, every Sunday. Climb up, boy, and get to heaven on your own goodness, on your own ability, on your own character, on your own good works. You and I have to have a ladder let down from heaven, my friend. And the gold boards here, and they're gold boards, but they're also wooden boards. They're called acacia boards, but they're also called gold boards. And you're accurate when you call him God, and you're accurate when you call him man. And he's a perfect man. He's not a lopsided man. The Lord Jesus was not any more man because he was God, and he was not any less God because he was man. And there never was a blending or combining of those two natures. And if you'll watch, he never functions in both. He can get tired and sit down at the well. Why didn't his divine nature minister to his human nature? But he didn't do it that way. He didn't do it that way. He functioned in his human nature because he's taking your place and my place down here. And he never did that. That was the first temptation Satan brought to him. If thou be the Son of God, he knew he was, 
why don't you take these stones and make them into bread? And somebody says, he wasn't tempted like I was. Oh, yes, he was more than you were. If you could make stones into bread, wouldn't you do it? I sure would. I would put Ms. Webb out of business and Langendorf also. Mighty mountains back of me filled with rocks. The bread that we'd have to give out today. May I say, but he didn't do that, you see. He never used his divine nature to minister to his human nature. You never find that. Remember, angels came and ministered to him. And actually, Mark means that when he was among the wild beasts, the wild beasts did also ministered to him after his temptation. But he never ministered to his human nature, never combined those two at all. He is the most wonderful person. May I say to you, you'll never fathom his glorious, wonderful person, but the finest picture I think you'll ever have of the two natures are in those bowens. What a picture they are. Now, I want to pass on, because I'm not going to keep you too long tonight. We have the bars that held them together, and probably I ought to turn and read here, because I do not have that on the screen. 26th chapter, verse 26, if you'll notice. And thou shalt make bars of acacia wood, Five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. Now this middle one went all the way, and the other four, the two above and the two beneath, I don't know how long each one was, but they were divided. And the normal thing is to think they were divided right here. But we don't know that. And the one who made the original here, he just made it halfway. And that's another logical conclusion you could come to. But we don't know that. But the one went all the way through. Now, actually, the bars are what help the tabernacle together. In fact, the matter is, they were essential to holding together the tabernacle. And again, I see in this very marvelous, wonderful picture, and I see in this, in the deity of Christ, that he today is the one that holds everything together. And here is a verse of scripture that I want to turn to, and there's so many remarkable statements made concerning him here. This is in Colossians 1. And it says of him, beginning at verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? And how can anything be an image of that which is invisible? I'm not going into those things. The firstborn of every creature. Here's where the Jehovah's Witness will tackle you. And the interesting thing is, you can save yourself a lot of argument with them. You'll just tell them to read the next verse. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, they say, well, up here, he's the firstborn. That means he was created. Well, if he was, he created himself. And that's a pretty good thing to do, by the way. He created himself, because we're told here all things were created by him. So evidently, this does not mean, and it doesn't have any reference to that at all. It has reference to his resurrection from the dead. He tonight is the only one back from the dead. He alone tonight. He's the first fruits of them that sleep. But the one that I want to get a hold of is not that one. It's here in the next verse. And the fifth thing, and he is before all things. And if he's before all things, my friends, then he must be the creator. He can't be created. And by him, this is the one I want, the sixth, and by him all things consist. And that word consist in the Greek means hold together. 
He holds everything together. And that's not the only statement that's made concerning him in that connection. Over in Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. We say tonight that a button can be pressed and a missile can be on its way and it can destroy half the population of this world. Did you know tonight he could speak one word and this entire universe would go out of existence? By him all things consist, upholding all things by his word. To me, the great thing is not the fact he created this universe. The Having created it is to run the thing. I always felt that Mr. Ford was a great inventor. Well, he sure never had any control over the Fords. And look at them today. Has no control over the Fords. The Lord Jesus Christ created the universe and he controls it tonight. It's held together because... He holds it together. I was talking to a man about this particular verse because I sat with this man. He's the man that constructed the heat shields for the return of the astronauts back into space. I mean, that's his field. I had lunch with him in New Jersey, and he brought this up about this verse. By him all things consist. And I said to him, I said, what really holds the atom together? He said, I don't know. Well, I said, does anybody know? He said, no. Nobody who knows what holds it together. And today, atomic fission, breaking the little fella apart, is a tremendous undertaking. And when you do, you've got trouble on your hands. May I say, he's got every one of these little atoms tied up. Just think of the number of them. Suppose he started untying them tonight. Man is, oh, he's made a few pounds. He's got a few little bombs today. By him all things consist. He holds everything together. And even these bars in that tabernacle speak of him and his tremendous ministry today. Now I want you to see the pillars that we have. There are three sets of the pillars. And probably we better bring this back. We have here four pillars, and we have, we have five pillars here. You're wrong. We have five pillars here. We have four pillars there. I'll get it straight in a minute. All right. Now, these pillars here are not any different than the ones we looked at the other night, with the exception that there's gold on top. And they were reminded immediately. They were bronze posts and bronze sockets. But when they went in there, they were reminded that the Redeemer, that on top, the capital, was a goal, reminding them of the deity of a Savior. They have to have a Savior who's able to save. Now, when you come to this second entrance here, it's called the Doa of the Tabernacle. And I suppose the best thing for us to do is to read these verses. Let me turn first to that which is the gate in Exodus, the 27th chapter. And I'm turning here to the 16th verse of the 27th chapter. And for the gate of the court shall be a hanging of 20 cubits of blue, purple, and scarlet, fine twine linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. All the pillars round about the court shall be banded with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of bronze. Then you pass into the holy place. And let me move over here to the 36th chapter of the book of Exodus. And if you have your Bible and if you have a new Schofield, you're having as much trouble as I am finding your place. I don't know why in the world we had to have a new Schofield Bible because I was just learning to find my way around in the old one. Now, when you come here to this entrance, this is called the door of the tabernacle. And in Exodus, the 36th chapter, and you turn down to the 37th verse. 
And he made an hanging for the tabernacle door of blue and purple and scarlet, fine twine linen of needlework. We'll talk about these entrances next time in the curtains. And it's five pillars with their hooks, and he overlaid their capitals and their bands with gold, but their five sockets were of bronze. Now you'll notice that as you come here, and I should bring back this entranceway for us. First of all, let's look again. This was so beautiful that I did, I felt like you should see it again tonight. This was the gate, you see, and tonight we're speaking of the sockets, bronze, and I should say silver. The gold is in the next one. But when they step in here, they are reminded of the fact that they are and have to be redeemed. Now you come here to the entranceway, you have five pillars, and this is the call the door of the tabernacle. Five pillars that are there. Now, will you notice their sockets here of brass? They are reminded of the fact that they have been redeemed, and only the redeemed can worship. The brass speaks of the fact sin must be settled. They must be redeemed people. Then when they step inside, they're stepping into a place that rests upon silver. And silver, by the way, is the coin of redemption. The great worship chapter, I've been going over this in the Through the Bible program and did the other morning. I don't think I've ever marveled more at any chapter than the 30th chapter of Exodus. And it tells here, actually, who can worship God. And it's still true today. And it has to be the redeemed. The first thing that you had given here was the altar of incense. Now you have who may worship the redeemed. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them, this they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. Now, the shekel here is not, if you please, a coin. It is nothing in the world but a bar of silver, and it was used for redemption. Silver is the coin of redemption. The tabernacle rested upon silver, telling to these people that they must be a redeemed people to worship God. Oh, how important that is. No unsaved man can worship God. To begin with, that altar prayer that is there. Peter says, God's ears are not open to hear the prayer of the ungodly. He's not. I used to get sort of sick of these plays where some old godless bum live any kind of a godless life and his little daughter gets sick and she's in a hospital and he goes and kneels down and prays and you, you see the handkerchiefs come out and people sobbing in the audience. This poor godless fellow, he's finally praying. I say to you, God's not obligated to hear his prayer. God says he hears the prayer of the redeemed. I think we ought to be pretty clear today about all of this sentimental nonsense about prayer. You're going to pray to God. God says you must settle the sin question. And when you step over here... This gate, you are stepping over these sockets of brass to tell you that your sin has been paid for and been judged. Because prayer is part of worship. My, how that needs to be emphasized today. We think today that prayer is a lot of this mouthing that you hear and a lot of repetition. And it has to be long to be a prayer God's going to hear. I sometimes feel, I hear some prayers... I feel like the Lord must say, well, for goodness sakes, hurry up. Get to what you want to talk about. What beating around the bush. Why have you come to me? The Scotch lady pulled a coattail of the preacher, you know, that the prayer meeting, he was praying, one of these typical preacher's prayers that we have, and he was praying along with it, and she pulled his coattail and she says, call him Father and ask him for something. That's what I do. Yes, sir, that's prayer. Let's get down to business in prayer. And let's remember that prayer is from the redeemed. And we are to come with boldness 
to his throne of grace on the fact we've been redeemed. Just these pious words and long-winded, repeating again and again and again. That's boring, friends. You pray to God when you come to him, and you come to him as a redeemed. And in the name of Christ, I'm not here because of my merit. If it's my merit, I couldn't come to him. I'm coming to you in the name of Christ. And I don't want to bore you, take up your time, but this is the thing I want to talk to you about. What's on your heart? Huh? What's on your heart? Talk to him about it. He loves to hear that. Our prayer meetings, oh, are they dead? Oh, are they dead today? And if you don't believe it, go in any church on Wednesday night. Boy, are they dead. Why? Just because we don't face up to what prayer really is. And that we've got to be redeemed. And when we go in his presence, we should mean business. We don't go in there to mouth a great deal of repetition and over and over and over and over again. Tell him what's on your heart. And then when you've told him, shut up. You remember he says he already knows, but he wants to hear you say it. Do you know old Levi? He was the high priest. He hadn't heard genuine prayer. And here comes Hannah. And Hannah, genuine prayer. And you know what he thought? He says, she's drunk. That's right. He says, she's drunk. First person he'd ever heard really pray to God. Everybody else came and went through the little prayer ritual and went home. But she was there. And, oh, she had a burden. (laughs) She had a longing. And she was there to lay hold to God. (laughs) And do you know what? She got what she asked for. She said, I want a son. Oh, I want a son. That other wife of Elkanah, she's had a knife in me all the time, and I'm tired of it. And if you'll give me a son, I'll dedicate him to you. Well, Levi said, she's drunk. woman talk like that. Yeah, but she's laying hold of a throne of God, and God's listening. God says, you'll have your son. Oh, how we need prayer like that today. When you go in there, friends, it means business. These are five pillars. May I just make a suggestion about those five pillars? All of this speaks of Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. He has one name, but five parts of it. Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's his name. And when you step in there, you're stepping in a place that speaks of that. Now will you notice we come to the third, and this to me is more wonderful than all. I don't know whether I've even got a picture of the veil or not. You just have to take my word for it that's in there. Yes, right here. We'll go back to this one. Here was the veil. And there were four pillars there. If you want to turn back to the 36th chapter at verse 35. And he made a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen. With cherubim made he it of skillful work. And he made thereunto four pillars of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold. He cast for them four sockets of silver. And this rests upon redemption also. Now, there were four in here, and here's where the veil was placed. And the veil speaks of the humanity of Christ. Now, we are yet to look at that, and may I just make that statement and leave it there. It speaks of the humanity, the human life of Jesus. The human life of Jesus separated God and man. That veil separated. And it's interesting, the moment he died, that veil was rent in twain. Because, you see, it was not his life that saves us. It's his death that took that to open up the way to God. But those four pillars are what concern us tonight. And those four pillars speak to me of the four Gospels, first of all. The four Gospels 
And these four Gospels, they present him. And did you notice that there's something different about the pillars, four pillars here, than either the pillars here or the pillars there? And what is it? They had no capitals. He's told specifically these are to be cut off. Every one of them cut right off. Nothing on top. He was cut off out of the land of the living. He died and he was 33. That's all you have of him. His life ended at 33. May I make the suggestion again? I think in those six hours that he hung on the cross, when he died, he was an old man. In those six hours, he lived three score and ten. But up to that, he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was cut off. That ended him. And the four Gospels present him like that. They hold up the human Christ who died when he was 33. Cut off, if you please. Then there's something else that's suggestive of that, because that speaks of our redemption. Over in 1 Corinthians, and I want to turn there. I'm having more trouble with this new Schofield Bible. I think I'm going back to my old one. 130. If you please, 130. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, one, righteousness, two, sanctification, three, and redemption, four. And here we have these four pillars holding up the veil. And when we are brought in there, we are in Christ, and he's been made unto us wisdom. He's been made unto us righteousness, and he's been made unto us sanctification and redemption. Now, may I just say this brief word and I'm through. He's been made unto us wisdom. He is the wisdom of God. To the Jew, the cross was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it was foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it's what? The wisdom of God. He's been made to us wisdom. And not only that, he's been made unto us sanctification. Well, sanctification is something that you have in Christ that gives you a perfect standing before God. And tonight, if you are saved, you're as much saved right now as you'll be a million years from today, because you are in Christ. And what he is, has been made over to you. And that is righteousness, righteousness also. His righteousness becomes our righteousness, and God sees us in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's the picture that's given to us here. And then redemption. He's been made to us redemption. For that veil was rent in twain. When it was, he had paid a price on the cross that brought us into the very presence of God so that we can come in now as redeemed ones. We don't go into God's presence on our own character or our own ability or on what we do or anything like that. God said to Moses, Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It's not to him that willeth, and it's not to him that runneth, but it's to God who showeth mercy. We come into his presence. We don't come in because we're Vernon McGee or you. We come in because he's been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And that's the only ground on which you and I can stand in God's presence. Never in ourselves. I do not know about you tonight, but I'll be very frank with you. If I had to go into God's presence tonight as Vernon McGee, I want to be very frank with you. I think I would want to go the other direction. But I thank God that in Christ, there's been made a new and living way, and I now can come with boldness to the throne of grace. And I can obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. This is the way in.